So there's something to be said for that staticness, um, working with the planet, working with nature. Um, this is this is my life, though. I mean, this is these are the materials that I am dealing with here. <laughs> I wish I was dealing with chisels and sledgehammers and loincloths <laughs> and picking berries and swimming from my bathtub in the river or something, and, you know. But that's just not you know, it's not it no more. Well, going back to the Renaissance for a second, what's next for me? I mean, the, the other masters were sculptors and architects. What else can we expect from you in the future? Anything we don't know about that you'd like to share, or is that a secret? Well, I'm a, I'm a bit of a writer. I love to express myself in, in, in my ideas through writing. Um, I love the combination of, of, of writing and painting because it, it completes a much larger area of thought. Um, I, I sculpt. Uh, I have. I Couple, I have a really large sculpture. The first one I ever did is like 14 feet tall. It's almost a ton. It's a, it's a pain in my butt. It's, it's everyone. It, it becomes everyone's problem. Who has a studio that I can store it at <laughs> until they kick me out and I gotta get a big truck and take it somewhere else. But yeah, more of that, man. I mean, I, I am. I tell you the truth. I mean, I'm actually looking to meet some people that can animate because I want to start taking this stuff into longer narratives. These pieces, I can't get a big enough piece to fit these narratives into. There's so much to say. Speaking of the writing, I've been reading some of the explanations and some of these pieces that you've got on your Instagram and kept forwarded to some. Uh, some of the stuff is prolific, so if you all have not read into Amir's work, uh, please follow him, because uh, I think it really helps with the insights, because the stuff is so deep, and I think we all have our own ideas of what it's supposed to be, but reading it directly from you and, and, and reading about the history and the research of the different cultures, it's super, super interesting. Back to the psychedelics for a second. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that role has played in your art, in your mental health, and what do you think, uh, you, do you have any thoughts on how that's shaping the, the future of the mental health crisis that we have in this country, in the world, and how that's unfolding on the legal side and in the media and in the counterculture as well? Yeah, you know, my greatest teacher was my mom. She was an artist. She's not with me anymore, but she was a hippie back in the 1960s and took a lot of psychedelics before she had me, and it was very uh, influential to her art. Her art it incorporated astrology and symbolism and numerology and dreams and the, the unconscious and, and this kind of thinking going to Carl Jung and stuff like that. So. Um, um, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, I guess, well, you answered kind of how that your history with that and how the psychedelics kind of influenced you and where you got started with yeah. it. What do you think is how the psychedelics are kind of relaying to what's going on with mental health in the, in the country and the right. culture right now and the legality and if are you involved in any of that side right. other than sharing your work, which I think is, is doing a lot to actually bring some light to the field and, and help... Uh, push it, but are you involved in advocating the outside of the artwork, and do you have any personal thoughts on yeah. where that's headed? Well, I definitely think that the psychedelics are a, a, a way to peel back the, the, the fallacies of life, all of this fake paint job of America that they put up, the, the propaganda, the, the, this stuff all just fades under, under the correct mental attitude, the, the correct, like, you know, if you can get your vision to tune in to the truth, to the real universal truth, you see that this is all fake. And, you know, I think to me, when I was a young teenager, I was caught up in everything from graffiti and gangs to hip hop to uh, whatever looked sexy in life, you know, from cars to humans to to lifestyle and all that stuff is so appealing. And, you know, it's hard to know where you stand and stuff in life in this modern day because there's no morals, there's no ethics, you know, um, there's no uh, mythological uh, structure that we live within. We live within whatever makes the most amount of money and the least amount of work goes into it. So psychedelics exposed me to that and showed me that I wanted to be connected to what was real that that was way more satisfying. The gratification you get from reality was substantial, that it lasted a lifetime. It wasn't something that was like, 
you know, fleeting like the trash. And so, yeah, you know, and I do think that under, um, under certain situations, I imagine a lot of healing could take place in this process. I'm not a doctor of it, so I'm not really sure how to teach someone to take the psychedelic experience into their, into their own life and um, not have a bad trip, per se, because <laughs> I've had plenty of those too. But I think that's also part of the thing, is, um, is, is how, do you, how do you find responsibility in that state of being? You know, when you're that free, how do you claim responsibility and take that and turn that into something, you know? I know that a lot of people are depressed in America, don't see a future. A lot of young people feel like, why do I even need to work a job because there is no future? We're just waiting for Armageddon to strike or something. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, well, if, if that's the if that's the if that's the small viewfinder you view reality through, then yeah, it's it's going to be a depressing hardship. But once you realize that you're 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 part of a bigger thing, and that this is the battle of your lifetime, you chose to be here to experience this battle for your freedom, for your independence, for your consciousness, and for your future of our genetic pool. That the that yeah, you know, life wasn't meant to be easy, you know? You're not just supposed to sit back on the beach and get a, you know, a coconut drink and, and just have someone massage you. That like, you, you, gotta, you gotta chop wood and carry water. You know what I'm saying, PhD? <laughs> um, are we, can we move on to a, another? I feel like a lot of the themes you just brought up relate to the, the next Destroy your illusions. Yes, could you talk a little bit about that? You, you know, I mean, sure. Yeah, the glass table and you know the way you have to circumscribe reality and what's possible. Can you talk about Back that? in uh, what was it, 2012? I went to England and I painted a mural on the street called False Prophets, which was these bankers playing Monopoly on the backs of the working class, and boy, that thing turned into a kind of a. a, a complicated situation for me. I got all the kinds of names. They thought I was this, I thought I was that. I had one group thinking I was promoting Freemasonry and pro-American capitalism. Another group thought I was an anti-Semite. Another group thought I was this. Another group thought I was that. And everyone just was pissed off at me for it. And then, of course, I had a fan base that was just in love with it and can, could see it. It was like, thank you for painting what we saw. And uh, that was a really major experience to go through because it was just me. And I was like, Jesus Christ, I just want to paint this piece. Wow, and turn it into this big thing. I, I couldn't even go to the store without someone, uh, uh, you know? So I was like, wow, I want to do another one. <laughs> and so when COVID hit, I was, you know, it just, the first few days, I was like, oh, shit. I'm not going anywhere, I'm gonna hide in the house. And then suddenly, you've gotta to go to the grocery store, and then suddenly it's like, nothing's wrong. They're tripping. And it just got like, wait, is this turning into like Nazi Germany or something? What's going on around here? And so I wanted to, I know that my conversation is abrupt sometimes speaking about this stuff. It can be upsetting and jarring to people, you know, because we all have a different experience and it hits us differently. Our, our health issues hit us all differently. So I just was like, okay, we gotta, we gotta boil this whole thing down again and rethink it. And I came up with this idea of, of telling the story. And I, you know, it's like, it's like a blueprint. You know, you gotta, it's like every drawing is a blueprint, but this thing had writing and it had notes and it had all this stuff attached to it. For a, for a while I had been planning this too. And so it all just came together, which is this, um, you know, it's this, 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 it's this conversation needs to be had, I guess, and I couldn't have it, so I had to paint it, and it, that makes it, you know, the process of painting something makes it almost acceptable in a lot of people's eyes when you can't talk about something. And it, what was amazing is there's just a group of people now, recently, that have come about from all different walks. They share the same mentality, though, which is censorship, and, th you know, to even paint about it was too taboo for their, for their acceptance. So, you know, and, and what I was painting was basically multiple layerings of game boards and glass ceilings that we coexist within. And um, 
down below the floor was, was, the, was the masses of us, just people fighting for our rights to be free, fright, fighting for the right to be an independent, free-thinking individual. And all those people are real people, and they all kind of influenced me in one way or another through the, through the, through the lockdown period. And everyone playing the game up above were just these like overprivileged mouthpieces, just not having any empathy with the rest of humanity at all. And that's life, you know? I mean, that's like, it's like, you know? The, the, the corporate world doesn't care that you're having a hard time or that you don't agree or that you want a different reality. It's like, you're not important. So I, I, I needed to figure out how to put this together and I wanted to sum it all up with a hero and that golden warrior standing on the table cutting through the illusion is, is all of us. It symbolizes that connected, collective consciousness. Um, and I guess he's cutting through this illusion, which is one of the art world's uh, mysterious anomalies, uh, this woman Marina Abramovic, Abramovic and um, her uh, sacrificial lamb, Greta Thornburg. <laughs> Uh, I mean, a lot of my a lot of my politics and thoughts are very poignant. They're very heavy duty thinking. I spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff, so it, it comes across kind of heavy and shocking. I, I assume to some people, and offensive to some, maybe even. So follow up on that. <laughs> When people see this, right, whether they agree with you or don't agree with you, it's definitely controversial, what do you want them to take out of it? Do you want them to have some kind of action? Do you want them to just think about it? Do you want, what should we expect? What does Mir want to Yeah, say? well, I mean, you know, with anything, I'm really hoping to just add another page in your book of history, you know, your book of reality of how you view things. I'm, I'm, I feel like everyone, you know, education teaches you what to think, but not how to think, and so I'm, I'm just, basically giving you another option, another alternative to the reality that you've been forced into. You know, no, nobody asked any of us if we want to live in a reality that's ruled by these specific rules, and we don't really have a voice to ever even suggest that we would like change other than voting, which is BS. So it's like, the only thing that f creates change is when something breaks, you know? And I I'm trying to, before we break, the world that we live in. I'm just trying to offer up some other perspectives. I would hope everyone would do that, all musicians and artists. And in this time period we're living in, everyone's just selling out to the pop 40 and, and painting for the couch. So essentially, you're trying to just lift the veil and have everybody do their own critical thinking about the Basically, experience. Basically, bring the apocalypse. <laughs> Can we move on? The unveiling. <laughs> yeah, man, this is the Younger Dryas, I call it. Um, Can you tell us a little bit quickly about the, the petroglyphs? Are they sp anything in specific, or? Over here in the little corner, I've got these, these two natives. They're, they're carving away at these petroglyphs, this, this mysterious symbolism that exists all across America, but then it exists all across Asia, and it exists all across Northern Europe. It exists all across Africa. It, uh, it exists everywhere. There's nowhere on this planet you can go, including Hawaii, where these symbols don't exist. And it got me thinking that this must be a, a, a time where we were not as verbally concerned, but we were more symbolically concerned, and we may have been more psychically intuitive of each other, so that these symbols were less of a letter and more of an entire idea encompassed in it. And through the combination of these symbols, you would have a narrative once again. And I was blown away by that. Um, but not just that, I've also become blown away by reading and learning about a lot of the ancient mythology and the ancient stories from the, from the dark ages that were written down that people saw in the sky there's even paintings in Europe of, you know, things that look like UFOs, or you don't know what they are. It's like a star with a guy inside of it flying with a steering wheel or something in the Catholic Church. They got, not in the Catholic Church, but in Italy, in some of them, they have all these paintings of the sky falling, meteorites, and just incredible stuff that doesn't really look like the world we live in, but 
it was their world. And I, and I was fascinated, like, so was the world different? And how often is the world different? Discovered Emanuel Vilikovsky, this awesome Russian, um, what was he? He was, into, he was into the mental sciences, psychology and stuff of humanity, but he also ended up studying how the earth and the planet, basically the mythology, the history of mythology on this planet. Where do these myths come from? What do they mean? There's other scientists like Anthony Peratt who actually discovered this one symbol. Um, there's a spiral and then there's kind of a stick man figure just to the right of that. That stick man figure is called the squatter man and that symbol is everywhere on this planet. And Anthony Peratt suggests that that is what he calls a plasma instability, which I've painted above these mountains right here, which is a cosmic event. And he's claiming these kind of cosmic events is what shaped the Southwest, not 100 million years of erosion, but actual singular events will cause these landscapes to look the way they look. And that these, these, these ca 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 catastrophic, excuse me, these catastrophes happen in cyclical pattern within geometry, geometry and time. And they, they've been recorded, and the powers that be have done everything they can to prevent us from knowing anything about this stuff. So I've become deeply fascinated with this. I've been traveling through the Southwest for the past four or five years, documenting, filming this stuff, hiking, searching it out, trying to find the rarest, most outrageous, beautiful, ancient artwork I can and and put it into context with what I'm learning about and see if it fits and I've been finding that there's a complete other reality that we've been lied to and I've always been that guy that's like the government lies to you you know social services are not what you think they are you know all that I've always felt like we don't need a parent to give us permission to be who we are that we need to find the independent voice in ourselves and be who we are and, and change the world, you know, constantly, because the world is constantly changing. We don't need to remain the same. And so this painting also incorporates some of the mythology of the ancient anomalous mythology of the giants. Um, not like a giant in the beanstalk, 50 foot tall giant, but more, more like a nine foot tall human. And that, you know, there was periods of time on the planet where an entire race of people were that big and we look at these megalithic temples and we still don't know how they're made. And so I, I, I felt very strong about that and I wanted to bring that into the play. And then you read about ancient Babylon, Zechariah Stitching and many of these uh, linguists who have transcribed the language, they're controversial and there's arguments over this stuff, but they're legitimate. They've worked hard at this. They say that there is a history of intergalactic, communication going on between humans and other things from other places, and that our planet was ruled by a variety of different forms of humanity, and eventually we killed them all off, and we're the ones that survived. And I think that's fascinating, and that should be researched and incorporated into our mythos, that we should have mythology in our lives. Mythology is really important, you know? It's like that symbol that you don't need a whole book, you just need a symbol. And it tells you the whole book, you know? And if you put a bunch of these symbols together, you're suddenly dealing with a lot of knowledge, a lot more than what the type of knowledge that we're used to processing. So it just, it really puts the reality into perspective. Like, who are we? What was it? What is it? And what are we going to do about it, you know? This really gets me excited because I study, <laughs> I study the ancient texts and the philosophy and symbols that you're, yeah. you know, even like the little baby Jesus and the like little UFO, you know, I know exactly <laughs> the ones you're talking about. Um, so this painting has a lot of those symbols. It reminds me of, you know, the Stoics thought there were different cycles to the universe. You know, um, I see here maybe the flood, yes. the idea of the yes. cataclysm there. Uh, yeah, so could you just talk about some of the, the specific symbols sure. beyond the, you know, the... the um... I mean, here's a, real, here's a real stretch for most people. Um, Emmanuel Vilikovsky says that our solar system is not as old as we make it. He claims that, this sounds wild, but he claims that we were a, a moon of Saturn. 
And it, that sounds so crazy. <laughs> that sounds insane. It sounds like, yeah, what are you smoking? But meanwhile, it's in the mythology. It's in ancient Chinese mysticism. It's in ancient Hindu mythology. It's in ancient African mythology. It's in ancient Egyptian. And the symbolism is there. It's, it, you know, Herodotus wrote about this. Plato wrote about this stuff. Saturn, Kronos played a major role in the ancient world, religious-wise, to the, the Trinity religions. Um, Saturn has played a major role within it. In the Catholic Church, in the Jewish religion, in the Christian religion, in Islam, you know, even even the suggestion that the, the, the uh, star and the crescent moon is actually a myth of Venus and an event that took place not that long ago that China and England have recorded, claiming that a comet flew across China and landed just outside of England, which before the Romans had invaded England had killed everything on the island of England burned every tree down, and as crazy as that sounds, you can go up to Scotland and look at the ancient uh, 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 Cathar buildings that exist there pre-Christianity, pre-Roman, and the, the limestone and the granite blocks that they built these temples with are vitrified and melted into each other. And the only way to achieve that is of temperatures of 3,500 degrees and up. So how does that happen? You know, did they have, what, 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 they just kept throwing firewood on that church and burnt it and burnt it and burnt it. What happens is stone cracks, snaps, and breaks if you heat, if you overheat stone for too long. The only way you can achieve a melted stone is literally from regular temperature to a super increase in temperature up to 3,000 degrees and able to melt stone. Otherwise, it explodes. If it's super hot, it doesn't explode. It literally melts. And so... You know, there, there is just evidence of, 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 a, of a climactic event. And, and, and then you have that built on top of other layers of climactic events, you know? The history of Pompeii and the volcano that went off and buried all these people and turned them to stone. You know, Mount St. Helens blew up back in the 1980s and it didn't turn anyone to stone. How did that happen? What, what are the cosmic events? What are the things, what, what, combinations of catastrophic events that you've got to go through to have something like that happen. Because we've been through catastrophes. We saw the tsunami in Japan. That did not change the world. I mean, granted, it screwed up the nuclear power plants and we got a pollution problem to clean up. But, you know, compared to some of the mythology we look at. So, yeah, you know, and I'm having this, uh, I'm basically showing um, how some parts of the world may have been recreated through these catastrophic, catastrophic events. The idea that Saturn, Venus, and Mars, and Earth were in their own system and came into contact with Helios and Jupiter as these gods in our mythology, and a cosmic battle took place, and a rearrangement of our solar system happened. And now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, we can see that most of science, physics, and the history that we've been learning about is absolutely incorrect. There's no sense to it at all. The James Webb Telescope is showing us that actually redshift doesn't mean anything, which we thought, like, you know, you could look out to the, see the beginning of time because it would have a redshift. That's not the case any longer. We have things that don't have redshift that are further beyond that now. So uh, this painting is an homage to the current, um, what would you call it? It's the... Um, it's the crisis in cosmology we're confronted with right now of the narrative that no longer fits the reality. You know, uh, the great flood myth. Uh, I have the melting of the glaciers taking place in this massive, just gigantic flood coming into this chasm over here. And, and these, these giants with their, with their human help that they're working with here are coming into realization of this. And the reason I paint these giants blue is because they're depicted that way. When you look at the, when you look at, um, who is it? It's not Ra, it's, uh, is it Horus? No, it's not Horus. It is, um, maybe it is Horus. I forget which one it is. Who is green? Who is green? In the green uh, Egyptian. Uh, is that one sounds of the, like Herodotus to me. <laughs> yeah. like well, I forget, I forget his name, but many of, many of the ancient deities are depicted with green turquoise skin or blue skin, like Shiva, or like Vishnu, 
And even in Native American tradition, there are blue-skinned people. Uh, in the Inca, they have a tradition of these red-haired giants that came from across an ocean that taught them after a great catastrophe how to farm and grow food and how to construct these impossible temples that look to me like you would need electricity and technology to cut these bricks and, and make these stones to, to do this work. So, you know, that's, that's where I'm going with this. I'm trying to talk about all of these strange mysteries of our reality that don't connect. And I guess that's what I've been spending my life doing. I mean, when I was a little kid, I used to watch, uh, what was that show with Leonard Nimoy in search of? You know, my, kid, my friends would be all watching Goofy Tom and Jerry and stuff and slapstick comedy blowing stuff up. I'd be in the house watching that and, and drawing and everyone would think I was weird. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love how integrated it is because you're integrating the cosmology but also these narratives. Because yeah. in the ancient Mediterranean world, I mean, the Hebrew Bible, I mean, some people question it, but there are giants all over. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, you know. There's a scholar named Adrian Mayer who writes about all the ancient authors who talk about the giants and wondering if they're finding dinosaur bones and thinking that these are their ancestors. So I love how much you're integrating all of this story. You know, uh, somewhere in Utah, I was just watching a video the other day, this guy was showing that there are three-toed dinosaur prints this big right next to human footprints yeah. out in Utah. We're about to go on a little trip and go film this because I want to share this with everyone. I want to find it and share it because people are like, nah, you're tripping. <laughs> It was liquid, the dinosaur stepped in it, it turned hard, and then it went liquid again, and later, you know, a million years later, a human stepped in. I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> like, that doesn't make no sense. What are you talking about? Stone doesn't go from liquid to stone back to liquid. It goes from liquid to stone. And that doesn't happen over a million years either. Something caused that to happen. What was it? I want to know, you know? So question the narrative again. Exactly. Let's chat a little bit about the, the Gaia piece, right? So um, this is more about the origins of life and becoming, and tell us a little bit about uh, you know, your thought process there and the, the giant figure and the, is that black hole or a look into the universe? Or? Yeah, well she's holding an Ouroboros. She's, she's mother nature, that's Gaia, uh, this, this uh, physical manifestation of the earth energy that we're ruled by, and, and I see her, see it as a, as a loving mother who's powerful and strong, who is at one with the animals, and, and you know, and, and if we could get in harmony with that, we could be comfortably in, at one with the animals in nature too, in the environment and the weather patterns, and know when to get out of the way and when to catch the healthy rays of the sunlight. But, you know, really, I painted this painting as an, as an homage to the lost, beautiful, loving origin that we all come from. You know, it took love for your mom and dad to make you. And so it took love to make this beautiful world that we've had. And that's, a, that's, that's an educational uh, experience to realize that. And that's what I wanted to paint was that, you know, that there was a time when there was a sense of beauty and, and, and purpose. Uh, a lot of these ancient structures have that. They have purpose, you know. Um, you can go into these structures and own, you know, and you can find resonance. And the feeling it vibrates your teeth and your gums, and it vibrates the little bone in your ear, and little, little areas in your body start to tickle when you own and hum in these resonant areas. And, I imagine what it would be like to be with 50 people and experience that together and do it all night on mushrooms, you know? Like, wow. Like, I think that, that, that you would just physically evolve from the experience. So the vibration is medicine itself, and that's a lot of what was chanting, right? So yeah. all of those vibrations are actually breaking up stagnation where there's, uh, you know, maybe blockages in circulation or emotional blockages or past generational traumas that we have. The yeah. vibrations will literally shake those loose yeah. and put things back into circulation, more or less get your chi flowing again. Yeah. Um, so as far as, as, as Mother Gaia there, so those kids that she's teaching, and what are your... What's your personal outlook? I know you have your, you know, these beautiful things, and you got some of your doom and gloom over here. Yeah. Um, and we talked about the destroy your illusions, and you know, some of the, you know, whether it be conspiracies or what's going on. 
Um, are you optimistic for the future? Do you think we're all screwed or where are you at with that? Absolutely optimistic. I mean, the, the, our whole civilization could get wiped off the map tonight and we could all be gone for several hundred years and when it comes back, it'll be beautiful again. I mean, that's my, that's my opinion of it. Um, you know, I think that we're way too uh, imprisoned and enslaved into our technology and into the, the greatness of ourselves that we think of us. You know, we think that we're so great. We don't have any idea. Like we talk about 165 million years of life on this planet or even more. We have no idea what any of that's been like because we just have this mistake that we're continuing to perpetuate right now which is illogical math, illogical education, illogical lifestyle, illogical materials we work with. Everything we're using is, is damaging to ourselves, to the soul, to each other. I mean, capitalism is damaging to the soul. Uh, you know, but at the same time, what else, what do you do? You gotta eat. So it, I think, you know, I just, as an art, you know, that's why I paint this kind of stuff. I don't have the answer. If I did, I'd just say it. Um, I don't, but I, I do know that the answer exists in you figuring it out for yourself and not asking someone else, what is it? Because we, we don't live in, we're not, we're, we are separate individuals for a purpose here, not so that we can follow each other, but so we can figure out and evolve and we're supposed to be gods. We're supposed to be creating, and you know, we're not creating. We're basically surviving, like, really sad in a lot of ways, you know? Like, we, we, we've created a world where we've made it hard for ourselves. So I, I, I paint the homage towards when we didn't have that, when we had plenty, when you could wake up and walk outside and pick your breakfast right off a tree. You had no responsibility other than love and respect and taking it all in and, and putting it, contextualizing it to some way that made sense for everyone else, you know? I mean, that seems like a holy way of living, a wholesome life. Like, we're so out of balance. So, so really that, I, I, I painted that just to really accentuate the beauty of, of perfection of a life, you know? Um, I want to live in that reality. I don't want to live in this uh, flimsy, <laughs> Temporary, obsessed reality, social media nightmare. <laughs> the snake. I see the snake across a lot of this art. Yeah. You see it here too. So I was wondering if you could talk about how you envision that when you incorporate it into your work. I uh, have always been fascinated how religion has taken the snake and transformed it into the symbol of evil, but ancient society always cast the snake as the symbol of knowledge. And so, since our world is so screwed up, if the symbol of knowledge was told to us that it's evil, then, 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 then knowledge is evil, and so you're not supposed to know anything. We're supposed to be stupid if we're, if we're gonna be good people, according to the rule book. So, the snake is transformation, too. I mean, her, the, the wheel she's holding is a snake eating its own tail. It's called the Ouroboros, and that is a sacred ancient image that really symbolized the cycle of life, that life eats itself, but it rebirths itself constantly. And deep within that is the universe, and deeper within the universe is that code. And out of that code, you can extrapolate all the variations of reality through it, and that's what she's trying to teach. And that snake is up there just symbolizing in multiple places. I mean, I got my big snake right here that, you know, you know for instance, you know, the egg is a symbol of life, the snake is the symbol of um, rejuvenation, and so the snake is eating its, eating itself to rebirth itself. And you know, I think a lot of people think, "Oh, that's scary," you know. And well, look what happened to your great grandma. She died. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> that's how it happens. <laughs> that's the secret of life, you know. And a lot of that is just yin and yang, right? You got yeah. your day, your night, your positive, your negative, your life and death. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the cycle that we all go through. Sure, yeah, absolutely. How about the, the piece in the back? Can you tell us a little bit about, about that and what the phoenix represents and some of these ancient temples that you got in there? And I see some Viking warships up in the sky. <laughs> and there's a giant in the mountain again. Yeah. 
give us a little some some, some well, knowledge. Well, give playing, us the science. Playing off of this theme again of Saturn being a moon of it, and playing with the idea of Planet X, which is this uh, kind of biblical, mythological, ambiguous thing that's not really understood. It's like a it's a cycle, and every time it comes through, for a while I thought that Planet X may be like some rogue planet that comes through our solar system and, and the magnetism screws everything up. And, um, um, and, and so I, I, I associate that to the phoenix. The phoenix is this cyclical pattern that, that sets itself on fire and destroys everything and it was reborn again. And I was like, like, is this possible? Like, all these symbols, when you start learning them, they all kind of line up together and they form deeper narratives. And so I, I fell in love with this idea of trying to explore that and talk about it. And it was a live painting. I started this piece live as a white canvas at a festival with my acrylics and um, no sleep, just around the clock, just hanging out, painting, tripping. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, I guess I brought it home and I repainted it and got it, got serious with it and put layers on it and just built it out to what it is now. And I was like, wow, uh, this is uh, uh, this is what I want to do now. Because I, I, I had a different body of work I had worked on previously, doing the same work. I'm, I'm always trying to recontextualize reality and give you that alternative. And so when I when I did this piece, it, it just sparked this whole show here. It gave me this this new platform with this fascinating kind of take on our experience here. Who are we? What are we doing? Um, what does this have to do with our current state of of life? And the conclusion for me was that we've been horribly lied to. You know, and, and that's why the world is so screwed up. We, we, we don't have any power, we don't have any say-so, and it was taken from us through these lies. We acquiesced, we gave into it. You know, we basically gave them our power because we believed their lies. And that was the deepest problem to me, you know. You started talking about something I wanted to ask you about. Um, it's a little bit of a shift. Yeah. Well, can you talk about just how long each one of these pieces take you, and when you're working on them, what kind of state you're in, and you know, how do you pull these points of reference? You know, do they just come to you? Are you reading? You know, how, how's the process coming together for you? Yeah, uh, I've, I've I've spent a lifetime reading stuff, and so just reading alternative great stuff has you know. Has, has got me going, but it, it's, it's everything. Um, I watch a ton of videos that I enjoy while I'm working on these things. There's a lot of stuff I do. I, you know, music, uh, it's, it's, it's really setting. You know, every artist has their own method of how they create. My method is kind of like, I gotta get into this. If I'm doing this kind of work, I gotta be burning some incense. I gotta have the right music going. I just gotta create this kind of, kind of mystical head state for myself and then my friends knock on the door, hey, what are you doing, man? I'm like, oh, they come and they're like, oh, wow, dude, you're on one. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm just trying to paint, you know? But really, it's, um, it, is a, it is a laborious, uh, it's a hard process that I love doing. I, I, I you know, I want to spend my time here busy working on something significant and worth it. And that's what I found doing this. Um, you know, that, that big painting back there, that probably took me about eight months, which was fast. Um, this little guy right here, this was two years of my life every day working on it. And it took two years because I went through a lot of depression too. It, this was what I, this, I call this my psychotherapy you know, my, that was my psychotherapist during COVID. The first two years of it, I spent working on this. And it, it, I couldn't even talk to half of my friends. And the, the, the damn thing divided everyone. Me and my own family got divided. My father and me stopped talking for a long time. Uh, you know, he had his own take that probably he ended up losing his own friends over. So it's just like everyone was getting divided. And I, 
decided to retreat to my studio and just stay there focused on this and not get caught up in that, not ruin friendships, not say something I regret later, and not, you know, who knows? I, I had no idea when it first started how serious this was. Was it real? Was this a made up thing? What, what the hell was going on? Has the whole world lost their mind? You know, and, and so painting is very therapeutic. We're getting a sign. We're getting a hook. <laughs> oh, 10 minutes time for Q&A or 10 minute Q&A? <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay. So okay. Q &A. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I want to make, yeah, let's make sure we talk about this, this painting behind you. We already did a little. Uh, I know there's one behind me as well, but it might be harder to see, but let's at least make sure we... Yeah, this is Sky, Sky Dragon and the Cosmic Egg. And, uh... Wow! Look at that rain! Damn! I wanted to paint Quetzalcoatl. I wanted to paint the plumed serpent. I wanted to paint that mythological reptile serpent that exists in Babylon. It exists in Mayan culture. It, it exists in Europe as the dragon. It exists in China as the Chinese dragon. This is the same dragon. Everyone's talking about the same thing. It's a, it's a freaking snake with feathers growing off its head. And everyone talks about this thing. And it's strange because we've been taught about dinosaurs our whole lives growing up, and now we're being taught dinosaurs had feathers. And that's a new addition to our understanding of these things. So I, um, in, in, in the course of learning the myths of all these cultures, descriptions of this, this, this mythological serpent, I, I started realizing that a lot of people were suggesting that it was a comet, you know, the, or that it was um, the, 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 the trail left behind by an event that exploded in our atmosphere that looked like there was a head to it, there was an explosion, and then there was a long tail. And a lot of people were explaining these serpents as, as things they were seeing in the sky. A lot of this mythology is, is sky anomalies that has been, wow, that rain's coming down. A lot of this is, is sky anomalies that has been cast into symbolism that is abstract and it's hard for us to recognize what is it that they were even talking about because how do these two things relate? But when, when you start to realize what the conditions were and what they actually saw, then it starts to come together and make sense. So, you know, and, and then like the, the egg, for ancient Gnosticism and ancient, like, super ancient Vedic knowledge and going way back to the origins of, like, prehistoric mythology. The egg is this great symbol of life that many people believe everything was born from. And so to me, that's like this really strange idea. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. But th there's this, there's this, it's like almost like there's this encapsulation of another reality within a reality. And then I start thinking about those Russian dolls that fit into each other. Start thinking of all these things that, that society tries to express that are just weird. Like, and, and what do these things mean? Why? You know? So uh, that's, that's, that's what this piece is about for me, is exploring those myths and putting it into a context of this primordial, reality that, that everything comes from this mystery this this misty state in our heads it's almost like that place is encoded in all of us deep in us like we all have that dark black lake with a mountain rising out of it and the the primordial ooze of 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 life and genetic matter and material that fell off of a comet possibly regenerating itself and this what is it? It's this cosmic genesis story that's taking place that, you know, and I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. I mean, I, I, I tend to appreciate Buddhism and Eastern philosophy much more, but I don't consider myself that either. I, I am not a Gnostic, even though I love that stuff. I, I'm a modern day man who is just fascinated with the world that we all come from. It's like my mother, my father, you know, my grandparents, like all of ours. Like this is our story. And, you know, uh, a lot of these paintings for me 
as I do them, I'm teaching myself. It, it's like I'm giving myself the permission to take the time off of paying my bills and reality off to look into this knowledge and absorb it where a lot of my friends don't have the time to do that. A lot of people I know just won't take the time out to do that because they're paying off their mortgage or whatever they're doing and they're just so busy with it that how could they ever think about this? And I'm like, this is your one shot. You're not coming back here as you. Like, you're not gonna know. Is, is, it, is, 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 is that worth it to ignore? Is that what you're here to do? Are you really happy just reproducing and making money? Because there's, there's a reason you're here. And if, if you feel, you should know. You know, you should know why you feel these ways. I think we'd be a better world if we could connect our feelings with knowing why we feel these ways. We wouldn't blame other people, we take responsibility ourselves. So that's really what my art is about. The whole point of knowledge and, and gnosis is to become God, who you already are. You're already God, but the government, the, the authorities will do their best to prevent you from knowing this. So I, I think specifically here in the West, it's difficult for us with the symbolism because we didn't grow up in a society where the language is pictures, right? Where you're looking at the Asian languages where every character, right? And we say a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah. Listening to you speak about your art, I think every picture is worth a million words, <laughs> right? So uh, I, we're very lucky, you know, in closing to have you, I think, to be able to translate, I think, some of these universal experiences that maybe we think about but haven't had this kind of time and to put it in such a way that's is so beautiful and so encompassing of all these different thoughts and ideologies to uh, allow you know the rest of us to kind of look into it. And thank you for sharing some of the, the process of the, you know your inner mind of, of how this works. And uh, you know the skill and the talent level speaks for itself. And to be able to get to understanding of it, uh, you know, just even though it's just been a small little glimpse, we could probably spend an hour or two on each one of these pieces. Oh, I know. Just looking at stuff like oh, I could have yeah. mentioned that. There's just so much. I mean, it's all, it's, it's encrypted art. It's encrypted. Uh, you know, I try to encrypt it and bury it deep in there and make you work hard to find it. Which is cool. And that goes back to the critical thinking piece. So yeah. I think that's, that's what the takeaway I'm getting from it is you want everybody to think maybe we don't have the, the time that you've put into it, but yeah. if, if this could maybe see some of these be like a, a little bit of a roadmap to help us kind of uh, understand some of these thought processes or go into like, hey, we've kind of all shared a similar experience but me or one actually expressed it for us in, in this way that nobody else could have put together in, in, in a very unique manner. Any closing thoughts on that? We'll take some Q&A. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll do the Q&A, but just once more to thank you for your time, your insight, this beautiful art. I'm thinking of possibly traveling this and continuing to add to it. Um, I'm so dissatisfied with the gallery world currently that I'm not really interested in like just ending my <laughs> ending the body of work with that kind of thinking. Um, I want to further it and continue it. I want to add more work to it. I mean, I didn't get to say everything I want to talk about with these pieces because um, I just I've got about seven or ten more to go maybe. <laughs> So, um, more work, uh, but definitely, uh, I'm also looking forward to spending some time doing some more sculpting now, some larger sculptural work, and um, yeah, getting out, getting out more. Um, I've been locked in the studio for the past five years, and I want to get out, paint some murals, talk to some people, be more physical. Um, I'm doing a lot of this uh, Southwest exploring and filming, documenting right now. So I've just started my little series. It's, it's getting a slow start, but we'll get it more and more each one as we go along. It's on YouTube. It's called The High Plains Drifter. And um, yeah, more of that, a lot more of that, but a lot more of this. I mean, I'm just gonna take this deeper. I mean, if, if, I, can, if I can go further than this, I will, and I'm sure I can. I, you know, there's uh, much deeper layers to peel back still. Um, they never is. And I'm starting to lay it out, but um, this, the world's a little strange right now with production and printing and distribution and all that stuff. So it's all that's kind of weighing into it. But yeah, I'm gonna start laying that out.
Much of my art career, I have been an outcast to the official fine art world because of the narrative that my art projects and speaks about. Um, I'm not like an artist that paints for the couch. And so this work, it's, it's meant to get to your mind. It's not meant for you to like just enjoy and casually um, buy furniture that matches it. It's, it's really meant for you to think about it and let it absorb deep into your soul and give you some sense of reflection. And so I was, um, I had an art show in San Francisco and I was dissatisfied with the way the gallerist was treating me and my art. He was renting it out to weddings, taking my art on and off the wall. And uh, I was getting notices on my social media that uh, people went to see my show and it wasn't up, and sometimes it was, and it was driving me crazy. And a good friend of mine, Greg Escalani, rest in peace, I called him for some advice, and he told me, just go get a van and go get your stuff back, you know? And I was like, thanks, I need that. I needed someone from the fine art world to give me the artist some sort of a, some, some okay and how to do, how to have some conduct here because being a graffiti artist normally we just go and handle it like graffiti artists and <laughs> thug it up or something and that's not really my path in life so I was like great so I did I went and got my art back it wasn't that bad situation and uh, I was a little depressed I went to a festival in the mountains that my friend told me hey come on up here man you need a decompression man that sounds like a lot so we went up there and uh, ended up he gave me a little bag of mushrooms you know my lady split it had a great time floating naked in the river for an hour or so, and then we realized we're about to be eaten by some animals. Let's go back to the crib. <laughs> go back to the crib, and I had like this incredibly cathartic experience where the the, um, the the trip came on much heavier and harder suddenly, and it was emotional. And I was revealing like my years of battling the art world and the embracing of like this feminine forest essence, this motherly universal force was trying to fix me and I was it was like it was almost my own psychology unfolding a necessary pathway for me to become okay with what I was going through and to figure out my path forward into the future and it was 2015 I felt like the art world had died um, and uh, that sounds mean, but, but I did. I felt like, you know, prior to that, we had like the, the big graffiti exhibitions, the MoCA Museum in Los Angeles that covered graffiti. You had like huge art shows all over the world and suddenly the economy was doing tough and art just was changing. And so my path forward was not going to be um, following that route anymore. I was finding my independence. I was finding my own power through the process, not relying on someone to give me permission or, or to give me the opportunity to be me. Uh, I had everything. I had all the pieces needed to put it together and I just kind of refigured my life and this cathartic experience just hit me like a, like a planet. <laughs> you know, like some galactic experience just exploded in my mind and I, I, I wanted to bring it together into a painting and tell this story of, of my journey into, into this. So tying it into fine art, and Robin and I had this discussion the other day, I see there is um, a little bit of a, almost a renaissance influence in some yeah. of your work, and I think as far as technique and skill level and quality, I, I think you're as good or up there with any of the masters from that era. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other interesting thing from that era, right, there's a lot of hidden symbolism, and you yeah. have a lot of that in some of your artwork. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the symbolism, some of the stuff that's going on in the background that we might not understand, that only you, the artist himself can explain to us about this piece? Yeah, you know, like, the geometry, you see a lot of geometry in all of my art coming through. Um, the geometry is very special because those are, that's visual, um, gnosis that you plug into when you're in that elevated head state where you're transcending your your physical prison that we're, we're cast into because we're more than this we're more than just a physical body we're you know our consciousness i like to see it it's not even necessarily all mine that, that, that i'm borrowing this consciousness from this universal god conscious energy that is the creative force that manifests reality from. And so there's different forms of geometry that allow that 
connection from your point in space and time to connect with that ultimate space and time and, and kind of wipe all this nonsense away and get down to what's real, you know? And so these geometries I was discovering were allowing me to access it through my mind and through my soul, and they're real. Um, this is the same geometry we use to build our world with, and they lie to us with this geometry, money and buildings and property and our own inner um, genetic construction is all based off of these principles. And so, yeah, that, you know, so, you know more of the symbolism is this, um, this, con this, uh, this, this uh, genetic uh, DNA kind of ethereal conveyor belt of humanity coming down that is the ancestors um, taking it back through time, through Babylon, and through ancient mystical history, all the way up into non-human form and on. And that realization was very liberating to know that I was all right. I wasn't making any mistakes, that I'm connected to a lineage that transcends the politics of this current state. And just that knowledge alone gave me power to, to be independent as an artist and not rely on the parental structure of the art world to give me, you know, to, to, to make it possible. Like, I, 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 this, this piece really started me on a mission to make it happen for myself and not to pay attention to the trends or the, the rules or the barricades that were in my way. A lot of gatekeepers. <laughs> With this painting in particular, when you talk about the geometry of it and structure, it makes me think of the built environment. And so the symbolism that relates to the ancient world, which is yeah. really the only thing I can contribute here. But when I think about the symbolism of the ancient world, you know, that art is static. It's, it's stuck on the wall yeah. or it's, you know, heavy in place in situ, right? So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between mobile art and static art, because between I what art? mobile art that mobile you can because you, you referenced it a minute ago the idea that you can go and just pick up your art and put it in the van you know right. and move it is there anything in your mind um, when you think about that contrast between the static art and art that's mobile is there anything well, going on? That's interesting. I mean that static art is um, it's still here. A lot of that mobile art is falling apart through the time. Or it's in literature, which I noticed you have the book on. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's the, I, I, I haven't thought about that too much, but um, that's interesting. I mean, you know, the, the, um, the mobile, the, well, hmm. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the mobile art. 